Good, good. Okay, so back in the early 90s, I was a trainee commercial pilot with hair that probably produced more lift than most of the small aircraft I flew. <laughs> anyway, one day my instructor Bob came out and he said, Ash, today I'm going to, to instruct you in instrument flying. Now this was pretty exciting because there's two flavours of flying. There's visual where you can see the horizon ahead of you and what's below you, which is kind of for the rookie pilots and weekend pilots. Then there's instrument flying. Instrument flying is for the professionals. That's being able to punch into the clouds. So I was pretty excited about this. Anyway, we went out, we did our pre-flight briefing and uh, grabbed a little Cessna 152, took off, went out to the southern training area, got set up at 5,000 feet, and Bob whacked this on me. <laughs> this little contraption, plastic contraption, is known as the hood and it constrains the pilot's view to their six instruments. Bob said, OK, now I want you to fly straight and level just by instruments. I did that, it was pretty easy. I was pretty good at this stuff. <laughs> then he said, OK, you did well, Ash. I want you to maintain 5,000 feet and perform a standard rate turn. Now, this was a bit more difficult. I had to organise to, to work the pedals and the controls at the same time as scanning all these instruments without the, the wealth of information from the visual uh, sphere outside. But I got it. I was pretty good. I was feeling pretty cocky. And he said, OK, done well. Roll out of that into straight and level again. So I rolled out into straight and level. But my artificial horizon wasn't quite right. It was a bit off. So I looked over at my turn and slip indicator and the ball was out a bit, so I kicked in a bit of rudder. My directional gyro started moving. I was flying straight and level, but my instruments were failing. The altimeter started rising. The directional gyro was spinning faster. The, the artificial horizon just slipped right off the whole dial. And Bob whipped my hood off. I'd entered what is known as the graveyard spiral. <laughs> now, in a recent study, the average pilot with no instrument flight training, punching into clouds, lasted a mere 178 seconds. That's two seconds shy of three minutes before spiraling to their death. Fair enough. My vestibular senses had tricked me. The, the, the sense that tells me which way is up had tricked me, and Bob got me good with it. Bob taught me a good lesson. Next time I'd know, trust the instruments. So we went up for the next lesson, and I failed. And the next lesson, and the next lesson. This was frustrating me. I considered myself a good, competent pilot. Yet, I couldn't accept the evidence in front of me. My intuition took over every time. My brain kept on making up. These excuses, oh, that's, the, the, this aircraft has a dodgy vacuum pump. The, the static intakes on, on these little tomahawks always blocks up. The instruments are failing. I knew the instruments were failing, but I couldn't seem to accept it. It's amazing, we're, we're often taught or told how wonderful and powerful the 100 billion or so neurons that make up our mind are. Yet, we rarely discuss the cognitive shortcomings that we have. I mean, at school, I was taught how the mind works. It's very much like a modern laptop computer. You know, you have your high-definition video camera and your mic that takes in everything around you. You've got everything then stored to memory, bit for bit, perfectly written to data on your hard drive. And our brains process things in a very logical fashion, like we should all have Intel inside stickers on our foreheads. This is the metaphor that's used, but it's not a very good metaphor. In fact, it's completely wrong. You see, our senses aren't like high-def recording equipment. We only take in snippets of information, and our mind fills in the gaps for us. As a pilot, we're taught a whole lot of tips and tricks to get around human limitations. Things like when 
when we want to find an aircraft in the sky, we've got to break it up into quadrants. You see, our eyes only see this much clearly at any one time. It's hard to grasp, but this is what we see. Our eyes dart around at 1,000 degrees a second, what's called a saccade. Our mind fills in the rest of the picture with what it expects to see there. So if you're looking up at the sky, it expects to see a lot of blue. You have to actually break up the sky into quadrants and saccade across until the aircraft lands within the focus of those saccades before you'll see the aircraft. And it's not just our visual senses that work like this. All of our senses work like this. Our mind just fills in the gaps for us without us being aware of it. That's why illusions work. That's why <laughs> Simon takes great delight in knowing how your perception works and being able to fool you, being able to manipulate that. And up here, it doesn't take in everything. It doesn't store everything to memory. It takes snippets, little grabs of feelings, of sights, sounds, tastes, smells, emotions. And then it pieces them together when you recall a memory. When it pieces them together, it makes up the bits in between again. It creates a movie. Only the movie is based on a true story. The next time you recall that same event, you're recalling it from that memory, taking snippets of that memory and piecing it together again. So the next time, it's actually more like a screenplay based on a book, based on a true story. Each time you remember something, it changes a bit more. It takes one more step away from reality, even if it feels like you remember it clear as day. And our cognitions, the way we think, they're adapted. We, we evolved to be really good at surviving in small social groups, for being able to, to match patterns, for being able to keep track of social relationships. Not very good at logic, though. That horrible feeling I experienced when I, I couldn't get my uh, instinct to match up with the evidence in front of me, that's known as cognitive dissonance. Now, cognitive dissonance is when your mind tries to hold two conflicting ideas simultaneously. It gives you a horrible feeling. It'll be a negative feeling. It'll be feeling sick. It'll be feeling anxious or even angry. Cognitive dissonance is, is the mechanism by which we start to being able to, I don't know, account for irrational behaviours like smoking. I've got a friend, Janine, very warm, intelligent lady. She's very smart. She works as an intensive care nurse. Every day, she's looking after people with throat cancer and lung cancer who are dying from smoking. She knows the damage that it causes. Yet she smokes. I asked her why, and she sat me down and said, Ash, I need to explain this to you. I'm a nurse. I work long, irregular hours. I don't get to exercise. I don't get to eat well. Smoking helps me keep down my weight. <laughs> you think the, the, there's problems with people who have smoked for a long time. You should see the long-term problems of obesity. So just like that, she'd rationalised away her behaviour with her knowledge. And cognitive dissonance does this in a number of ways. Also, it's a great protector of our self-concept. What we think of as, you know, I'm a good, moral, intelligent person. That self-concept, it protects it for us. This guy will never admit that he was wrong about invading Iraq. Not because he's evil, it's because he really thinks he wasn't wrong about evading Iraq. He, um, he thinks of himself as a good moral Christian. He was president of the United States. He, he was leader of the free world. He was the good guys. Unfortunately, he also set up the perfect context 
for making bad decisions. You see, George Bush was well known to fire or demote anyone who disagreed with his opinions. So he cocooned himself, he surrounded himself with yes-men, he protected himself from cognitive dissonance. So when he decided that there must be weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, all his cronies went out and scoured the intelligence reports, picking up the most tenuous little bits of information, stringing them together to feed his belief that there were weapons of mass destruction. That's what's known as confirmation bias. Seeking confirming evidence of our beliefs and disregarding or minimizing the impact of disconfirming evidence. And that's just one of the mechanisms, it's one of the most common mechanisms that our brain uses to protect us from cognitive dissonance. But it's just one of many, many biases that we have. In fact, you may be experiencing one right now. Now, these biases build up. <laughs> That's what you were meant to be seeing. These biases build up and attack our ability to reason logically. And people take advantage of this. Whole industries, billion dollar industries, are wrapped around our faulty reasoning. Things like cosmetics, anti-aging creams, you're right. <laughs> Vitamins and supplements. Well, you urinate them all out. They don't boost your immune system. If they did boost your immune system, you'd have an autoimmune disease. <laughs> Alternative health practices. Aligning your energies. Well, we got rid of that concept when we discovered the central nervous system. <laughs> Just the other day, I was on a tram in Melbourne, and... Uh, spotted a, a guy, a young guy in a suit, and he was wearing one of these. It's a, a power band bracelet. Anyway, um, the, the, the makers of power, band, uh, power Balance claim that this piece of silicon with a sticker on it will make you stronger and more flexible. Now, on, on face value, that is laughable. It's silly. But he probably didn't come to this belief from a claim like this. He probably came to it from seeing one of his sports stars wearing it and then noticing other top athletes wearing it. These things have to chip away. Now, Power Balance are smart enough to give away these to every top athlete they can and sponsor key top athletes to wear them. So he's had this, he's formed an idea, he goes and searches online. Power Balance has littered YouTube and blogs with testimonials and demonstrations, much like they, they've used for years in martial arts and, uh, and in applied kinesiology. A simple trick to show that, you know, it makes you more balanced. So, he probably saw this stuff, and that was confirmation bias, building up the belief. And then he went out and spent 60 hard dollars on a rubber band with a sticker on it. That cemented his belief even further. People then asked him, you know, does that work for you? And he would recall a time when he performed a bit better than normal <laughs> and not recall the times when it was average or below average. More confirmation bias. When more people asked him, he would keep recalling those same events of better performance, except those events would now get even better, and even better, making a legendary performance. So, his power balance bracelet is working. It is good. Then someone might come up to him and say, well, you realise they, they actually did some scientific tests. Double blind showed that it's just a rubber band. <laughs> Science doesn't know everything. Don't be so closed-minded. You've got to try it to understand. These are the types of things that people will come up with when their mind is painted into a corner. And it's not just that. When you come up against a hard argument or an unwinnable argument, cognitive dissonance can cause anger. If that 
argument is unwinnable on both sides. It escalates to rage. It can escalate to ideological wars. People fighting to the death, trying to prove their point, trying to prove that their imaginary friend's the real one, not yours. It's not all doom and gloom, though. There is hope. Science is testament to that. Now, when you say science, people have the wrong idea a lot of the times. Science isn't a person or a thing, an organization. Science is simply a process. It's a process that was designed specifically to overcome our biases. And as well as that process, it's also the body of knowledge that results from the process. The process is just known as a scientific method. It's simply down to making a prediction, testing that prediction, and then coming up with your conclusions. But most importantly, being transparent about how you did it all, so other people can pick apart your arguments. Other people can test and see if you reasoned correctly. It's a very important part of it. And enough people, like, like Temple said, enough people working on this. They, they spend their whole lifetimes doing small, detailed work, making tiny little increments in knowledge. It's no, none of these eureka moments that you hear about. It's tiny increments, but it all goes into a pool of knowledge. And because of that pool of knowledge, in medicine alone, I've never seen a child with smallpox. I've never seen a child afflicted by polio. I've never had a, a loved one die of measles or diphtheria. These killed millions of people until we figured out vaccines for them. And closer to home, this old fella, my dad, I should have lost him twice in the last 15 years. He actually had a, a tube fed through his groin and a, a balloon pulled through his heart to flatten the fatty deposits in there, saving him from having another massive heart attack. He also had tuberculosis injected into his bladder a number of times to kill the cancer that was growing there. Just recent advances in science have kept him around with me today. And it's not just in the area of health that this way of thinking is useful for us, getting rid of uh, these misunderstandings, actually knowing about your brain and how it's tricking you, compensating for cognitive dissonance and cognitive biases. It's everything, any type of decision-making, from uh, deciding on a consumer product, fighting with your partner, to public policy. Accounting for all these cognitive biases and being open about how you reach your conclusions is a useful and powerful thing. And we should start with the schools. We should start getting rid of these outdated metaphors for how we think. Teach kids how we actually do think. If we can do that, they'll appreciate science more. Just like when I was a pilot, it was hard for me to get over this whole thing. There was many white-knuckled, sweat-soaked flights for me to be able to, to get over my own internal battle and trust my instruments. We can all actually go through this process. We can all learn not to start with conclusions and find evidence. We can learn to start with evidence, evaluate it, and come to a conclusion. We can all learn to use our brains more effectively, and I think that's an idea worth spreading. Thanks.